everyone and welcome back to my channel The Grim Reader. I am Kathy Grimm and today I'm going to tell you my top 10 reads for 2021. Of course, except for one of them, none of these were, were published in 2021. And also, I don't, I don't distinguish genres, it's all just lumped together because I read so, so few uh, non-fiction books that it wouldn't make any sense for me to separate that out. First off, I have one book that I forgot to put into my top 20. So it'll be somewhere between 20 and 11. And we'll kick the last, the lower ones out, but that doesn't matter. And that is um, Trout Fishing in America by Richard Brodigan. He wrote it in 1961 while on a camping trip with his first wife. And it wasn't published until 1967. And it's, it's this famous, I'm going to go with hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic, a uh, work of fiction where trout fishing in America is the name of the main character and we we follow his adventures and there's also different timelines and it's somewhat autobiographical as I recall and the reading experience was fun, interesting, exciting, weird and of course with, with highly experimental works of this nature it is you know it's the kind of book where I mean things turn into other things. It really is very trippy in that sense. Um, the, the That aspect does kind of wear, you, that sustains you, but it didn't sustain me for the whole way in quite the same way. So at the end, you kind of just, you get used to the weirdness of the star and you're just like, okay, okay, okay like, come on, come on, <laughs> let's, let's get on with those stories. That are, but it was still very good. And I went in and put it back up at five stars from four. So, and I, you know, I do, I did read a little bit about his life, um, kind of, um, he comes from a poor background, um, sort of itinerant somewhat with his mother, I think, or father, would live in hotel rooms and stuff like that, so interesting upbringing, just a very interesting fellow, and um, of course he, he did commit suicide in the 80s. I would like to read more of Brodigan, and um, very interesting work of fiction that definitely deserves a spot in my top 20 at least, I'm not sure where exactly it would fall, but... That's that. So that's the honorable mention, so to speak. Moving on into the actual top 10, as I peer over to my list here, we have a work uh, from 1926, Lolly Willows by Sylvia Townsend Warner. Um, the very strange story. Well, I mean, it's sort of, it starts off in a very quiet way of this. It's just a story of this, this woman, Laura, who lives with her kind of overbearing um, her sister's family and they're very middle class and they're kind of overbearing and she's she's overlooked and taken advantage of and it turned I mean in in various sort of annoying ways to the point where you find out that the brother-in-law has done stuff to her her inheritance which is not right and then so I would say the last third of the book is all about her breaking away from the family and the room that she lived in with the family and going to live on her own in this funny little village called Great Mop. And she kind of slowly, she she finds her true self and, and, and by that I mean she becomes a witch and she actually does have conversations with Satan or the devil, but he's very mild mannered. He's not like satanic or he's not like a cliche devil. He's sort of a person that she can talk to. Or, and that's pretty subdued, that part, as I recall. But but she does sort of witness something like a witch's Sabbath and sort of participates in it, but not really. Then she kind of runs away from it because it seems kind of she doesn't like it that much. But what she does sort of end up, she, what I remember really appreciating about the book is her interactions with nature and how she sort of liked to be the solitary, the solitary time spent in nature. Um, I'm not sure how that translates to her becoming a witch, but we sort of see her finding peace and coming to a sense of herself and what she wants out of life. So it's sort of a proto-feminist in that sense. And that's what I really appreciated about the book. So, and I did like the writing and um, would like to read more of Warner and also perhaps reread this at some point. I'm not a big rereader. <laughs> Maybe I should start doing that. But I'm such a slow reader that I kind of read things and then I want to move on to something else that I haven't read yet. But definitely recommend this if you're interested in um, this famous novel by Susan Townsend Wilder. Moving on to number nine, which I will insert a picture here. It's my first audiobook. There are quite a few audiobooks on this list. So I still kind of just lump them in with the regular books 
Now, I recently talked about this in one of my wrap-ups. It's the work recommended, or I, Britt Pastore from Pastore Time rec, uh, talked about this book, and so I snatched it up on, as an audio, so I listened to it. Medical Great Music by Sanuka Champion, Steve Davis, and musician of all sorts, Kavos, Kavos Tarabi. So it's a dual biography of their love of music and what kind of music they loved, and then how they kind of come together to form this other band called the Utopian Strong. Really amazing work and I really discovered my, I, I've always kind of enjoyed reading about music. I'm not, I'm not a, I have a sort of interesting relationship to, to popular or the music that I like, which is, I'm not as passionate about it as they both are, but I do kind of like reading and thinking about music and also listening to it. And so Steve Davis is a little bit older. I think he's sort of my age, maybe a tiny bit older than me, not much older, so in the early 60s. Uh, and so he's coming at it from his big band love of his life was this French prog rock band, Magma. And I started listening to them and they have a very long, they, their their body of work is amazing because they're still around and they've been around forever. So they're still, and, it, and the drummer is the main guy, Christian man van something and i just found out about them through him for reading this listening to this book and that's another reason why it's on the list is that you know when you read someone's account of their music that they love and you respect their choices you go and check out the music and so i found all these interesting new bands because of these two and of course their own band and so he likes magma and then carlos is a little bit younger and his first love was stray cats a love that i do not share <laughs> I mean, I like Stray Cats. They were they had some hits, so I know about Stray Cats. And then he then his other big love is Iron Maiden, which is another love that I do not share. But so this is a book for anyone interested in metal. So he's coming out of a true love and appreciation of metal music, specifically Iron Maiden, and then he morphs over into some something more experimental, ambient, perhaps I don't know, sort of experimental rock, I would say. And all the bands he's been associated with, I, I, I do not know. Well, now I know them through him, but before I didn't know about the Cardiacs or Gong or Guapo. There's another one that his first band had a long name and was sort of more rock. It's also kind of infused with a bit of a punk, post-punk um, is going on there too. Um, and then now he makes his own music under his own name, and that's really interesting too. So it seems much more sort of quiet or experiment or ambient, going towards the ambient. I don't know, um, not getting my terms right here, but but really interesting, really fun to listen to with their funny. Steve Davis is hilarious. I mean, he's just a funny. He's like a storyteller. You can tell they're both really good at writing or, or telling you stories about their lives. And Carlos's life has been really interesting because he's been a full time musician, but always sort of one who has never really made, you know, he's never become a household name now. Perhaps he will because of this book and everything. And um, yeah, and really interesting music. And I've uh, actually, there's one group, I think a new one is called Knife World. And I'll post a video that I, a couple of their videos are on the YouTubes and I really like them too. So I'll post their songs. And it's a really enjoyable listen. Anyone who likes music of the prog rock, post-punk, punk, perhaps, an Iron Maiden variety <laughs> should listen to this. There's a lot about how they, they first they are DJs, so they DJ Glastonbury, so there's a lot of Glastonbury memories and really, really good good stuff here. So definitely num worthy of number nine. The book at number eight kind of reminds me a little bit of it because it's also a, an autobiography of a young boy and it's Boyhood Island. So the third work by Knausgaard, Karlova Knausgaard. And I also listened to this, so I'll put a picture here of Knausgaard. And I really enjoyed this one. I really felt so, I felt so sad for little Knausgaard. I mean, uh, he's, uh, he does a really good job of portraying himself as a full, fully fledged young man or young person, little boy. You know, he's, he's vain. He's superficial. He's, you know, somewhat arrogant and thinks he's better than other people when perhaps he's not. And he did a really good job of, sort of negotiating the fact that he on the inside feels super cool, but he realizes how he's not cool and how he's sort of trying to be cool or seem cool and all his relationships. And to make that interesting to an adult audience, I think is quite the feat. And he did. And of course, the main thing that is sad about the book is his abusive father. His father was toxic and abusive to him physically and uh, emotionally, withholding, mean, 
and, you know, the type of person that you sort of tiptoe around because you're afraid that they'll lash out at you. And, you know, for, for little Knosgaard, this is really sad. And I think it did kind of traumatize him. And perhaps it's, I guess, it's one of the reasons why we have these books is his relationship to his dad. Thoroughly enjoyable, really well read, too. The reader was excellent. I forget the name of the reader, the narrator, the, the voice. Very well done. Very moving and enjoy sort of funny and moving at the same time. I would say that the latter half where he does get kind of start getting in just more interested in girls can get a little bit sort of like, okay, 13 year old Knopf's guard, enough with the fixation on girls' bodies and stuff like that. On the other hand, he's a 13 year old boy in Sweden, you know, in the seventies. So, you know, it's not even, it's like barely first wave feminist stuff going on. And so in his perspective, it's, it's not feminist. So that can get a little, but even that is sort of, he didn't, he didn't turn me off enough there. I mean, he's not, he's not, He's not a terrible person, even if he, he was sort of a person, a product of his time in that sense. Uh, and, and there's also little stories that are, that are quite amusing. But um, yeah, the one thing I kept, I kept wondering about is his mother. Like, why didn't she stand up to the father more? Was she also kind of being abused or, you know, was, it wasn't, te it's not textbook domestic, but it was borderline going toward in that direction. And maybe she was sort of maybe that's the reason why she should stand up for her little boy more you know he should not be doing this to her she should not make the little boy eat apples when he doesn't want to eat apples i mean the whole foods thing and and other things that he did really mean and and sort of like mean because not like he imposes the rules but he doesn't ab abide by his own rules if you catch my drift i can't there was one example of that and and you can tell that little klaus is really attuned to but you said this and now you're sort of now you're 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 punishing me for something that you said, you know, so that or, or he seems to sort of, there's always reasons for why he did what he did and, and the father is, doesn't want to hear any of it. Anyway, it's the type of sort of black pedagogy that forces you to also become sneaky and secretive because you're so afraid of what was going to happen if you, you, you can't, it's not, there's nothing to be gained from being honest. And so in a way, it's like teaching the kid to be dishonest because that's the only way you can sort of survive without being completely traumatized. You have to become sort of sneaky and you can't just fess up when you've done something wrong because the punishment it will be too severe, if that makes any sense. I don't know who does, but that's kind of how I felt. And um, yeah, so that's my number eight. Moving up, moving up. Number seven, I will insert here another ebook. This is an ebook, so I don't have a copy of it. Lasta by Raven Leilani. Very, very strong book uh, centered on this uh, young female artist, Edie, and her complicated, messed up life. So she did so, some of her decisions are sort of questionable, whatever, whatever that means. But but in terms of the book, that kind of makes sense to me. And she, she, why she did what she did, even though technically it perhaps wasn't the best idea, I could see why she would. You, and that's, the, yeah, that's all I ask for in a book. If it's plausible from, from inside the book, um, even if it's a stupid idea, like, you know, to have an affair or whatever, to do something that's quote unquote immoral, amoral. If, if the motivation is, there, is made clear to me and I can sort of follow it through, at least, you know, in terms of the book, then, and she did that really well. I really liked Edie. I like. I thought what she did was fine. And I mean, not fine, but understandable. And I really liked how the interaction with the family. I mean, it was a little bit of a train wreck. The train wreck. The pleasure of watching something bad happen, or you don't know where it's going to go. But uh, I really like. And I re and I, as I recall, the ending was sort of a muted happy end. And she did seem to have come out of the whole ordeal with this family that she interacts with. And ha she did some have some kind of closure there, as I recall. And she sort of moves out of where she's living. She's poor, you know. She has she's struggling for for money because she's an artist. She's a job, and so so economic um, stuff and cl class stuff enters into this novel. Uh, I thought it was really well done, and I like the writing a lot. So, number seven for for luster. Uh, another ebook. I put the picture here. Uh, Kazuya Ishiguro's The Buried Giant was an early read, very early read, early on in the year, but I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I liked the, the focus on the, the elderly couple. I liked the sort of pseudo medieval fantasy world that they were in. I, lo I really love the stuff about memory and how 
a sort of collective what happens when collectively something weird happens with people's memories as opposed to individually it's like the whole world has alzheimer's not just one person i thought it was really interesting even though it wasn't resolved in any clear way but it's the kind of thing that it would be hard to resolve and in a way the fact that it wasn't didn't bother me that much the ending i thought was a little strange as i recall but not bad not bad and it's such a shock to me that his the other book that i did listen to kazue um clara and the sun was such a disappointment i really did not care for clara and the sun i did not think it was a good book the characters were flat the, the plot was sort of who cares the only parts of Clara that I sort of liked were when we were in Clara's mind and we see her strange kind of AI type intelligence describing the world. That was kind of interesting. But it was such a difference from this book, which I really enjoyed. So I don't really know where to go with, go with Ishiguro. I did like Remains of the Day. I like Buried Giant better, but I'm a little bit like, well, what next? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. So that was my number six, The Buried Giant by Kaz Kazuo Ishiguro. Number five. The Door by Magda Zabo. So now we're getting into what I call, you know, this would be higher if it were not for the books that are higher. So the, the last five are really just pretty amazing stuff here. Very interesting uh, female-centric read of these two women. Um, one very highly educated and part of the intelligentsia of Hungary and the other the opposite, so to speak, but, but in a way the more important character. Uh, Emirates. I've never, you know, she's such a strange character. And the dog, the dog stuff was amazing. Viola the dog. I love the dog stuff. This is very strange. Kafka-esque in the best possible way. And um, the fact that it's so female-centric is sort of interesting to me. Like her husband is barely plays a role in it. It's all about women and their relationships and their friendships and their uh, weird, the weird things that are going on from the past too. It's hard to describe because it really is just about their their interesting relationship and about the fact that the dog is called Viola even though it's a, ma a male dog. And her relationship with the dog is so strange. I mean, Emirates is just a really interesting character. So, and there's probably a lot of stuff that I didn't quite get because it has to do with Hungary and Hungarian history or just, just references that I just weren't, wasn't quite getting, but I really did enjoy this a whole bunch. So that's number five. Number four, might need a little bit of justification for this one. It's an audiobook, and it is Dickens' David Copperfield. I just think this was amazing. And so, sort of, you know, on the other list, in the other video, I had the trollop. I held up my trollop, and I said, I said I loved it. So why is trollop not in the top ten? Whereas this is, this is epic. This is um, sort of Victorian culture in all of its you know lows and highs and in-betweens at its best and the, the depiction of child child david and his upbringing and also his poverty and his walking to his aunts i was in you know in tears and laughing at the same time and there's nothing like that quite quite like that on trollope he just doesn't have the scope it's really sort of more like about a certain class of people so he doesn't have the epic scope that this has I mean, there are things in here that are pretty awful. I mean, the depiction of Dora, the, his great love, she's sort of really hard to take on a certain sense. But so my take on this is we see David Copperfield as a young, young boy being born basically from, you know, but looking back and all the time when he's sort of impoverished, we see him sort of being almost adult like in his ability to persevere and not get too sad about everything. And then what happens is he grows up and he becomes a little bit more soft and perhaps sensitive and, and almost whiny and sort of too attentive to his comforts and stuff like that, which is what happens when, you know, all of us bourgeois, first world, whatever people, we're, we're, we are able to indulge sort of things that we, if we were impoverished in the way he is in the beginning, we you'd have to just be different, you know? And I really thought that was really an interesting part of the book. The fact that in, when he's sort of more bourgeois and he's sort of trying to get ahead on his own, he becomes almost like a, a little bit of a snob. And and I'm not saying that I just, I, I still like him and I still think he's a very interesting character, but I thought that was very well done on Dickens' part, to, the way he really 
portray him as a full full person in these change these subtle changes and also of course the beginning part where he's so impoverished and he's and like the people that he hangs out with the funny family the the macabres oh my gosh i mean it's hilarious it's really really funny um a book that can make you laugh and cry you know page after page um and then the whole stuff with Peggy and what's her name that runs away with his See, there's still stuff about Copperfield. I'm like, how dare you, like, defend your, um, the one, the steer for his school friend. I mean, there's a hilarious Good Goodreads review about it being a, a queer novel about his love for steer falls, And, yeah, <laughs> there's something to that. And how he kind of, even at the end, he, he's too, he's too mild with, with someone like steer forth. But, um. What was I going to say about the early part? Oh, I've now forgotten what I was going to say. Well, and the the early part also kind of is, has me reminds me a little bit of Jane Eyre, which I which is also one of my favorite novels. Just be, the depiction of oh, that's it. How how Victorians treated children and often didn't know how to treat children and did treat them as little adults. Sort of they sort of expect way too much of them, or they overly indulge them and they turn them into Doras. You know the the completely. You don't even know what to do with Dora. <laughs> she's like this, you know. She's just gonna will turn into dust if you touch her. She's so she's so fragile. Um, anyway, so yeah, I thought it, it's just worthy. It's just a classic. This is a classic. Everyone should read this to be confronted with stuff to do with Victorian England and and Victorian life. And yeah, everyone should read this book. That was number four. Like, I think Dickens is, in a way, more accessible than people like Eliot, even though I love Eliot more, I would say. And I'm not quite sure. I do want to read other Dickenses, but I don't, I'm not that, I don't know about, I probably should read Great Expectations, because cause I'm, I'm reading stuff where the, that figure, she's, I probably should read Great Expectations. But there's other ones I want to read, too, like Bleak House, Hard Times. Tell me about your favorite Dickens and where I should go to next. Please don't say Oliver Twist, because I tried to listen to that one and I couldn't. Sometimes it gets me down, the abusive part. Like when he's with his father, the, the, the stepdad, the evil guy, I had to stop listening because it just pulls me down too much, makes me too sad. Because he was like really evil. And the sister, those two, oh my gosh. But really well done. Murdstone, oh, Mr. Murdstone and Miss Murdstone. But really well drawn. I mean, really kind of gripping stuff. That's number four. There is a book that... <laughs> would definitely have been higher up if it were not for the other two. And that is The Recognitions, which I read starting last December into almost, I don't know even when I finished this, Easter, I think. It took me a long while. These long books take me a long time. And I even had to rush through the the, the last part. Um, very phenomenal read, very special read. Um, the style is really interesting because it is somewhat experimental in, in some parts. But then, and then, then the other thing is, it's really well written. The, the, the depictions or sense, sentence to sentence, it's really well done. But it is dripping with references to art, to history, to music, and uh, of, at all different levels, like low, highbrow, lowbrow, all, all, all the in between brows. <laughs> and so that can slow you down if you go, but, and it is sort of well documented through this person, Stephen Moore, who has the website where you can go look up a lot of the references. Um, so unless you're into that, you may be a little overwhelmed with this. This may be, this, this is a, this is a denser read, I would say, for a lot of people. But I did like the story and I really kind of was drawn into the story of Wyatt, the painter, whose upbringing was very strange and whose father's very strange and whose wife kind of can't get through to him because he is the strangest person of all. Wyatt himself is very, very strange. But for anyone who, I'm not sure who I would recommend this for. I mean, it, <laughs> you'd have to just try on your own. I know a lot of people read it this year. There were a lot of read-alongs of Gaddis, partly because the NYRB reissued this and then the other ones. And I know that, you know, some of the big book tubers, Leaf by Leaf, like all big Gaddis fans. And I have now one too. I will move on to, I think, JR. That's the next one I have. And I need to reread this too. I do need to reread this. Um, you have to kind of learn how to read these big long books, have to, you know, how to go into them and immerse yourself, but also kind of step back and just read them, just get through the pages and without losing the thread. I'm, I'm going through that with my next big read right now. 
uh, I tend to get too, too bogged down and then it really slows me down and I don't get I don't get on with it so um, but yeah definitely a highly worthy read and a very enjoyable one very different <laughs> uh, the last two famous this would be you know for were it not for number one it would be number one but it's number two Anna Karenina by Tolstoy, an amazing work of fiction, very, very accessible, very enjoyable, even more so than Dickens, sort of epic in scale in a different way, more, it's more adult, it's about adult issues, the women, I mean, these, the characters are, better, you know, much more fully drawn than, for example, Silly Dora in Dickens, and his focus on Anna, and I'll never forget the, the last chapters where Anna is kind of going frantically running through the city, extremely moving. Um, he really gets into people's heads in interesting ways, and that, and I really like that. I really like all the characters. I like the the stodgy guy who marries the Le Levine. I like Levine, and he marries uh, Kitty, who is also really interesting. She's sort of is she Dora like? No, she's actually pretty pretty smart and has two feet on the ground. Once once things push comes to shove, she shows her strength and she shows that she's in a way smarter and more adult than he is. Um, he's really, uh, Tolstoy's an excellent writer and very, very, this is an amazing and very memorable novel that, that we should all read. I think this is a good gateway classic. This and Dickens, I mean, if you've never read, maybe you want to start with something a little bit shorter, but, but this is, this is not difficult. This is moving, accessible. Okay, there's quite a bit of names and Russian stuff, and sometimes it does go into Russian politics a little bit, and the serfs, and or how to treat the people that do work the land. But I still think it's pretty accessible. More accessible than this. This is dense. This is you know uh, harder. I would say to read. This one not so much, and thoroughly enjoyable. And my number two for the year. I don't know where the number one fits in terms of difficulty. And I never would have guessed that this would be my number one book, but it is. Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Absolutely amazing. And so and so not female centric. <laughs> I mean, it's very violent. It's very strange, but I absolutely loved it. Page by page, it blew me away. Um, the characterization of the judge. I mean, in a certain sense, it's a very strange Bildungsroman, isn't it? About the kid. And I remember the last chapters were kind of strange where things speed up a little bit. And then we have the last key interaction. Um, I would never have picked, thought I would like this as much as I did. But I remember sort of picking up, picking it up randomly and because uh, of discussions on the Discord. And then just starting it and being blown away from, from the beginning. See the child, he is pale and thin. He wears a thin and ragged linen shirt. He stokes the scullery fire. I mean, that's almost Dickensian. <laughs> the, the little kid, the focus on the kid. Night of your birth. Oh, it's just so well done, so well written. I don't know where to go next with McCarthy. Give me, give me a clue as to where you think, well, which, which one should I read next? I think I may have started with the best. <laughs> so this is 1985. Yeah, this is my number one read for 2021. As you can see, a pretty momentous reading year. And I'm excited for 2022. A little bit daunting, daunted by the big books that I'm reading right now. It's hard. It's even harder than recognitions. But more on that on my weekly updates. Thank you all for watching. Have you read any of these? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Feel free to say so in the comments. And I wish you all a lovely end of the year and also Happy New Year. I, I will be back next year talking about the last week of my reading, uh, most likely on Tuesday. So I haven't quite decided if I'll continue with the weekly updates, but you know, I might just because I do like to check in. And it's nice to have the sort of repository of videos to go back to. So maybe I'll just keep it up. Thank you all for watching and I will see you soon. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, it's so long. Bye.